very nice to meet you all. My name is Bridget, Brigitte Varady, originally from Hungary. I lived in Ireland in Europe for 25 years, and only the last five years I moved okay. to the States, and I live in upstate New York. Um, my work is dwells in traditional craft, um, everyday working life, and I investigate this through sustainability and cultural heritage. Um, I employ community workshop, video interviews, um, and I experiment a lot with materials. Yeah, my name is Louis Steffenberg. Nice to meet you. Very nice. And I do art for many years, and I work in a synthesis of the medium. Uh, so I am interested in, in all of them. And the concept of put them together and work with the definition of art. So I'm interesting also at the same time of what art is. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Esperanza Cortez. I was born in Colombia. I was raised in the United States. And like my work, I'm in between. I'm not, I feel like I'm not from here or there. Um, when I do residencies in other countries, I feel as foreign as I do here. Even though I've spent my whole life here, I feel like I've never been fully accepted. And so I work with that edge of culture. Um, and so my work is um, interdisciplinary. I like everything. I love to touch everything. I like to work with everything. But I'm especially, my work is especially informed by uh, the aftermath of colonialism that we're still living through right now. That impacts everything that is happening politically, culturally, um, educationally. It's in our lives every day. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Yali Ramagosa. I'm a Cuban born uh, multidisciplinary artist. I am living now in Queens, New York. My work raises critical questions about the exclusion and erasure of the Latino artists in the diaspora. I work with many mediums, such as performance, video installation, photography, and costume design. Through my alter ego, Coquita de Kibando, I approach feminism and marginalization, and also um, the political trauma that I have been through coming from Cuba and living in the United States. And is that alter ego has some traditional um, connection to the Cuban culture? Yes. I grew up in the 90s, in the middle of the big depression in Cuba. So we didn't have anything when I was growing up. I used to uh, play with a Cuban uh, doll, paper doll named Cuquita. She came in magazines that it was called Mujeres, Women. And that was my Barbie. I never had Barbies, I just have Cuquitas. Yeah, I remember I worked in Ireland with a group of very young people. And uh, when we were in the first, after the icebreaking exercise, in the first round of question, like, what would you like to be? Uh, what do, would you like to study? So these were 10, 12 years old children. And, and everybody, all of them were just said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I created this puppet uh, idea that every children should make their own puppet. And I presented to them that what about if you make your puppet and you name your puppet and the puppet is going to talk. And I'm going to ask question from the puppet. And every children after they made their puppet, they were able to express their feeling and what they want to do when they grow up, what they want to study. Because the puppet was talking, not them. Mm -hmm. That was a very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I work and teach a lot with the community. So the alter ego, it's, it's such an amazing concept and how to express. So you work with engagement. Yeah. You are interested in the directly engagement. With the people. Okay. Very interesting, right? Something that is being in fashion. Well, I've, I've worked as an artist in residence at El Museo del Barrio. I started in the, I think it was the mid-90s. And um, that's what I've done for most of my life is work as an artist in residence with museums and cultural programs, uh, galleries. It's, it's a fascinating thing because, you know, art is able to pull people out of their everyday experience, which is part of what we're going to talk about is, you know, is art healing, you know, the healing capability of art. And I think it has a powerful ability for every age group. I mean, my youngest student was two, my oldest was 97. So, you know, lots of different approaches and projects. And I think it's 
powerful. And then, of course, it always ends up informing your work because you can't get so deeply involved with people and, and you know, stay cold to it. It's, it's powerful. I mean, so then that informs the way that I've created my work because then I see what impacts people's lives. Yeah, in, in, in times of the pandemic, uh, the, the subject of, of healing is related to, to many things. But when you talk about art, like uh, uh, it, it can work as an auto-healing. Uh, for example, I have uh, the COVID last year, mm. by November 2020, at the very beginning, right? So I, I managed to do a self-portrait uh, during the time that I was in sick, uh, <laughs> I did a self-portrait, and I, I think they made me feel very good after I, mm -hmm. I, I started doing it. But at the same time, uh, art it become the, the, the major outlet for the people that was uh, in their houses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so... We need, we need to take a look of that uh, power that, that you just mentioned and that relationship with the, with the inner and the rest of the community that is what you approach. Very interesting. I'm an educator as well. So when you were mentioning the age range of your students, I was thinking my age range and just very close. I spent all last year and most of this year teaching from my house. And it was really a moment that I learned how you said that art is really an outlet for many people. It was a moment that they really enjoy, children, families, and even adults. Um, I was working with senior centers and so on. I feel like when we were talking about healing, for me, it's a very particular experience because through my work, I also tried to find healing within myself. And I was born in the Cuban revolution, uh, the dictatorship of Castro's government. And I think we all uh, were born in trauma. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we have to heal since the moment I was born. Mm -hmm. And then I have this other moment that I have to leave. I had to escape my country and come here. And I start a new life from zero, learn a new language, learn new costumes, a new culture that is so different from the place that I was coming from. And I think that was another moment that made me feel impacted emotionally, psychologically. And I've been healing from that moment uh, since I was here and I came here. So I feel like the pandemic made me think about how strong I am mm. and how strong we all are and can be and how to share that experience that I'm living with others. Like, it's okay. Uh, we all have different situations, but we can come through this. And um, I feel very healing as well, talking with other people and having conversation, community is, is very helpful. When we're talking about healing through communication, we need to, to, to understand that we're talking about the immaterial uh, uh, proposal. Uh, like, for example, when you work uh, in a psychology uh, aspect, uh, you are not giving away a system, but you are creating a language that affects uh, the subject itself. So the medium, it becomes uh, an excellent tool to heal or to make uh, harm. Uh, of course, this is depending what you think the art is. My point of view of art is, is very extensive. But we talk about art as an art, high art. I think that we are sitting here thinking in a high art, right? Mm -hmm. We are visual artists. We want to be in a museum, you know, high art. High art. But there is the guy who do nice drawings in the corner and everybody go to talk to him. And, hey, man, do a drawing for me. Oh, I want to put a, that drawing in a tattoo here. And he also is an artist. So the healing of art 
not necessarily is constant. Art can heal and also can do harm. That's, that's what I think. That is a great form of art. And it's a great form of, you know, elevating culture, mm -hmm. okay? either to perform dancing or to perform instruments. It's great. And that can be, I believe that's very, very healing. In, on, on many different levels, but I generally try not to think so much about the stuff that irritates me, you know, and focus more on like what we're doing and how we're pushing certain ideas and, you know, bringing uh, attention to the community about subject matters, about ideas, using materials, whatever it might be, performance to engage them in a completely different way, which then negates what they're receiving on a daily basis through the media. That is also art. Well, that's what I'm agreeing and disagreeing with you. <laughs> and I love that you are mentioning performance because, you know, in this time of the pandemic, all these spaces were closed. Performance artists, we faced a crisis, right? It mm -hmm. seems to be. Uh, we didn't have a place to perform. We didn't have an audience that could attend to our performances. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is a great time to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I started to make public uh, actions, public performances uh, in museums uh, with a project that I call No Me Pongan en lo Oscuro, Do Not Bury Me in Darkness, where I raise uh, awareness about why the Latin women living in the diaspora are not included in museums and mainstream institutions. Museum of Modern Art, I saw her. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I've been in the MoMA PS1, uh, MoMA, uh, Guggenheim, the Metropolitan, and the Whitney Museum. Mm -hmm. And it's a project that it keeps um, growing. And, and it was all through Zoom? Like, it was all uh, online? For no, we to went to it. the public space, mm -hmm. and we performed in front of anyone who was around. I usually live stream on Instagram and make pictures and then I publish online for people to see. I was recently um, featured in Hyperallergic magazine and they made a wonderful article about my latest performance in MoMA PS1. I mean, you and I are working with similar ideas. I used to do performance years ago. Really? Yeah, I did one at Documenta in the Sistine Chapel. I, but it was not... They, it were, they were more like you, like guerrilla performance. It wasn't like someone gave me an invitation. I showed up. Everything I did, I could have been arrested for. But I wanted to highlight what everybody else was missing. Um, but then I had my daughter, and it was just... I went into dancing, but then that became difficult. So then I ended up teaching because, you know, I get to do what I love and I get to get some money. Wonderful, pay the rent. But then that, you know, it, including the visual arts, you know, like when you, when you work with people, it's so, it's a give and take. It's not just, you receive as much as you give. But also you become an observer. Observer of your own project, observer of the conversation between the people and yourself and an artist, and that observation somehow shapes the project. And I really like that element of having a conversation over months and months or years and years, like most of my project take years and years mm. and years, and get to know people, having conversation, me opening up to them, they opening up to me, and then just observe the process mm. and see what will come out of it. And the magic and the healing and the magic. And for me, it's a healing process. For me, it's also magic things to see and witness and observe as an outsider, the process itself. And for example, the last one of the last projects I did in Ireland with the Irish sheep farmers, the markings we have is generally red over the tail. We used to have red on the horns as well, but we, we kind of dropped that since tagging came in. And the sheep will mix, so you can see them from a distance. Yeah, shearing the sheep is the hard, one of the hardest jobs you have to do with them, shearing and dipping. But most shearing is it's uh, slow. Yeah. Generally, I need help. Usually, one of my sons actually. I think me. what was for me very magical moment when the farmer asked me to record our conversation. And I asked back why. And he said, because I never told any of my son mm -hmm. what I'm telling you. And I realizing now that nobody's going to come back and take over the farm. 
So this is going to be the end of it, of my grandfather, my father, and my generation, and all of the traditional knowledge, the wisdom, all going to be lost, so please record this to me. Mm -hmm. And that, I find, that is the magic when your conversation with the people turn the project into, into an, an, I don't know, into, into, into your practice, into recording. Well, I know what you're saying. I mean, I did, for a long time, I worked with elders. I'm considered a mm. master artist working with elders. And the main thing that I worked on was working with people with memory problems, mm. Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, and uh, Parkinson. And I created projects to get them to release their memories, to be able to talk. And they sat with someone when we recorded what they wrote, and it was really magical. And to my surprise, all of a sudden, I start doing collage. I mean, I never intended to do collage, never. But my collage is with, with pieces of embroidery, glass beads, and all the stuff from my former life as a dancer. So it's, it was interesting, like, because that's what happens. It's like you use the material to help people pull out important memories, to record important things, legacy projects, and then you end up being seduced okay, by the exactly, same material. Exactly. So I don't have, like, I, I, we were talking that I work with textile, but the textile came out of the project. Yes. Then I made tea because it came out of other projects. Yeah. Then I do video, then I do performance because the interaction with the people yeah. or with the memory uh, it requires or I am falling in love or drawn into by the people to that yeah. uh, material or that uh, technique. Yeah. yeah, that's it, very interesting because it really feeds you. It does, it does. And then I did a, I took a bunch of jewelry classes because I felt like that was one of the things that could really trigger because mostly older women who were widowed. And then I end up, you know, after so many experiences and it's fantastic and, you know, of course, there's moments where you get awards for what you do. But then it ends up in my work, but it doesn't end up in my work immediately. It takes years. All of a sudden, it takes time. you know, and it's a fascinating thing because you see people who have arthritis challenge themselves and then talk and tell you stories that you just want to record everything. And then all of a sudden, you're like, hey, you know, I always liked that material. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting because all of that <laughs> intent to bring back the language, the creative language, to the small setting. Because in some way, industrialization uh, developed an expansion of many things, right? And the assembly line of many things. But then you have to stop and take a look of some of the roles from the originary groups. Uh, and go back to the village uh -huh. or go back to the tribe where a, a common activity uh -huh. uh, become a, a common way of living together and learning and also uh, uh, recollect the history. You really re reminded me how I started uh, this process of the conversation mm -hmm. with people and investigate cultural heritage through this project because it's to do with my own healing. So my grandmother, I lost my grandmother who brought me up mm -hmm. and it took me years to be able to face that. And suddenly I realized that every project I started I didn't intend to talk about her, and but it became a conversation between me and my grandmother. And then suddenly I was stopping into how she lived, what she did. And I felt really sorry I never had a conversation with him about where she came from and her traditional and her heritage. And it was all lost with her. So the project started, I started a project, nothing to do with my grandmother, and slowly she sneaked into it. And it's become a conversation, this project became a conversation with her and me. And for example, the tea project I mentioned, I just fall in love with the goldenrod, like a whole meadow of goldenrod, the sun hit it, 
in upstate New York in my walk, and it was just gold. It was just a magical moment of gold. It's just a field of gold. And I said, what's that? So Goldenrod, I started to research Goldenrod. And during the history of Goldenrod, there is, you know, there is the Boston um, event of dumping all of the tea. So what are they going to do? How they are going to have tea? So the Native American teach them to use Goldenrod. It's a really great tea substitute. And then I started to create like, tea, conversation, people. And then suddenly my grandmother popped into the picture. This is what she used to do, collect herbs, dry them, make her tincture, make her tea. And then suddenly the whole project became about my grandmother. So I created this public intervention that I use golden rod to dye. My fabric created poof for people to sit down and I created thousand tea bags. Each were numbered, and the whole project became about her, how she, she was like a woman of hosting and caring for everybody. And this whole public intervention became like her. But I wasn't intending to do that. It's just somehow the healing process of losing her sleep into my project. I mean, I think that often happens. I mean, like, it's odd that you say that, but so, I was a very sick girl. I didn't really know what was wrong with me. But my grandmother lived with us. She came to live with us when I was like 11 and a half. And she would always make me teas when I didn't feel well. And after she died, within a few months, I was in the hospital with ovarian cancer, much to my shock. But I always felt like all the little things she did, the teas she made me, the broth she made me, it somehow sustained my health. As soon as she died, I became very sick. I mean, she died in my arms. It was a powerful, impactful moment. But I believe what she did was just so powerful. It, so, it gave me so much love and strength. And so it's funny, it's like I, for a long time, my work was so much about her ideas, not her, I didn't paint her portrait, but her ideas, they were manifested in my sculptures. And then later on, my other grandmother came around. And then lately I've been working with ideas that are more about my parents and the things that I learned from them. Um, they didn't intentionally teach me, but my mother embroidered, sewed, designed, uh, crocheted, knitted, you know. As, and my father, you know, did all this metal work. So it's, it's, I'm just fascinated how people, somehow they come and visit you while you're working and you're not aware until later. Um, yeah, until later. Well, where, where is, because there are these many activities that, that we do in our everyday life. And is many uh, creative uh, proposals that we do during the day. But when is that arts begin and social relationships uh, start? Because sometimes it can be a very narrow uh, trail when your intention as, a, uh, as an artist can get lost. Um, it's a very narrow uh, trail uh, sometimes between the art proposal and the art itself. So, so I find myself in the social engagement projects uh, that can come out. You were talking about family and how you felt very inspired with your family history. And I have a question for you. Do you think of yourself as survivors? As what? Survivors. Survivors. I really like the phrase that you said, helping me to survive. So I'm not a survivor, but being an artist and making work, it's helping me to survive and helping me to go through a situation, but also to create this conversation with myself and through the conversation resolve issues but through making my art. So I think the art is really helping us and then what we put it back to the people and I, I am with the same with you that it's, it's really important to help, to, to help people to find the language of art and through the art to, to communicate.
And it's very powerful. It's really, really powerful. One of my projects was about anti-fracking and go against the fracking companies, but with the farmer. And when the farmer realized art not only just painting, but it could express their opinion, and the opinion matters, and the people react to that opinion, then they embraced art. And we are talking about 70, 80 years old people living in the countryside. And when they realized the power of art, of expressing opinion and going against big companies, that was also a moment that it's 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 brought home to me that keep going and keep I did a project in Poland during a residency. Um, it was at a time that the Polish president had just died a year before in a plane crash. They the government was considering selling part of the Polish farmlands to uh, German companies that produce uh, uh, vegetables, fruits with pesticides. And so I arrived in Poland and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is terrible, you know? And I had started my opal project, which means eyes. I make these ceramic eyes or these paper eyes. And so with a community, mostly of older people and, and um, teenagers, we went through the forest putting eyes on trees. It was the craziest really? thing. It was fantastic. So my idea was if nature was looking at us, how ridiculous are we? So we put eyes all over the forest and we went through different cities. Children were delighted. Everybody's putting trees and everything. And I had never have been interviewed so much on television, on radio, in, in, uh, in the newspapers. People were like, this is fantastic. And it got everyone talking about things they wanted to talk about to begin with. I mean, I wasn't doing it to get attention. I just thought we are living in such a messed up moment where, pe where a government is willing to sell what is the property of, 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 of the country, of the people themselves, selling and our then the, farmland. And then through art powering the people to voice their right, right, way right. of looking at things exactly. and their opinion. Which is what you're doing yeah. with, with yeah. women. Yeah, exactly. Right. And in the last performance, I was talking about uh, empowering women and Latinx women in the museums. And everyone was just so agreeing, like, finally someone said it. And they were so grateful to be in the moment and been experiencing that so accessible. I think empowering, what you just said, empowering mm -hmm. contains the healing. Because mm -hmm. once you're empowered, the healing begins. Yes.